So this evening is a blended meeting. So I'll be doing the discussion first and then uh, by around a little bit before uh, seven o'clock, people will be going out to the hondo, but we'll start with the blended. And it's, it's good to see some new people. Ross, we have, I don't think I've seen you before, have I? No? Okay. Uh, no, no, good. really new, thank you. Thank you. And everyone else we've seen, and I, I welcome everyone. And this evening, um, several, uh, probably over a month ago, maybe longer than that, uh, I was asking people about what kind of topics they would like to see on a Wednesday evening uh, after doing this for 26 years. So multiply 26 times 50 at least. That tells you how many times, how many of these topics I've had to come up with. Um, obviously, I do some over again. But one of the topics was on Buddha fields, uh, because we find that Buddha fields is mentioned uh, in a number of different sutra. And somebody had asked, they're not really sure what is meant when we make a reference to Buddha fields. And so I thought that that's why we chose this evening's topic. And you can see the definition at the very top of the sheet if you uh, had downloaded that, um, which is uh, Buddhakestra, uh, Sanskrit, uh, uh, Japanese Busetsu, are spheres of activity of a Buddha. And so the, the concise view, as you can read, is that there are many universes or realms, and each universe contains a specific Buddha, similar to Shakyamuni Buddha. Then these are pure lands. And everyone has probably heard of, of pure land Buddhism as an example. And so that's the Buddha field of, of Amida Buddha as an example. But there are many Buddha fields and the pure, the pure land that we hear used most often is just one of many, many, many pure lands. Obviously because it's, it is a um, concept that's associated with one of the most popular schools of Buddhism in East Asia. Um, that's the one we think of when we say the pure land. But in fact, that's just one of many. And uh, Akshobhaya, which is one of the other Buddhas I list on this sheet, is another one for which there was a quote-unquote cult of Akshobhaya uh, practitioners in early China. And so there was a pure land that was associated with him. But in fact, we think of the 13... Uh, primary Buddhas, and each of those has a pure land that's associated with him or her. And so um, the pure land essentially is in distinction to the Saha world, the world that we're living in right at this moment. And so I'll, I'll leave it there just for a moment and just make the comment that I had known about the Buddha fields for many, many years. Um, however, until I started doing a little bit of digging in this, it's one of those topics, it's like a rabbit hole. You can keep, keep going deeper and deeper and deeper and find yourself a mesh in all kinds of stuff. Um, and that was the case with, with looking up the Buddha fields because there's a, an incredible literature about the Buddha fields. And they that literature actually begins relatively early. And I'm just gonna, gonna go down the sheet that, that you've got in front of you so I don't forget which points I wanted to make. Um, the debate, the debates, plural, about the Buddha fields has been going on for almost as long as there has been Buddhism. And we can look back to the time of Ashoka which would have been uh, in the third century BCE to see the very first references of Buddha fields. And exactly what that meant then was, re was interpreted, reinterpreted, debated, discussed by different schools of Buddhism as time, as time went on. And each school and each lineage tended to interpret Buddha fields in a particular way, which would, um, was consistent with their, their overall view, whatever that might be. But overall, and, and, and by the way, this debate has not stopped 
the debate over Buddha fields is still ongoing. As a matter of fact, especially among the Tibetans, you know, the Tibetans have a, a, a very active um, practice of debates and debates about the Buddha fields is one of those debates that they, they like to, to uh, uh, debate about quite a bit. Um, but the primary function of the Buddha field as I say in here, is to teach sentient beings in a Buddha field. And what I mean by that is the field, the, the realm of sentiency, which is what we're living in right now as we discuss this. Although I, I have to say, as I look in this room and there are whatever number of people closest, I can see here, and, and I, I know they're all sentient. Well, at least they're all breathing. And <laughs> and but when I'm looking when I'm looking at the screen, I'm making the assumption that you're all sentient, but it's 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 a little bit different. There's a virtual <laughs> that's there, right? <laughs> and but this 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 realm of sentiency is contraposed to the Buddha fields, so that the Buddha fields consist of a specific Buddha and various bodhisattvas. Now, even this is a matter of debate. How many, how many Buddhas can you have in a Buddha field? But at the very least, each Buddha, each Buddha field has one Buddha that is the primary Buddha in that Buddha field, such as Amida Buddha in the Pure Land, which is the Western Paradise, Akshoba, which is the, the Buddha field for the Eastern Paradise, etc. Um, and in the Vimalakirti Sutra, and I, I found this really interesting, I'm going to go in the background a little bit and then open it up to questions. In the Vimalakirti Sutra, and I'm just reading, <clears throat> after Shakyamuni Buddha reveals a Buddha land, Shariputra asks him why Shakyamuni Buddha hat field has so many faults. Because a Buddha land, a Buddha field is a pure place. It has no defilements. It has no, it has no um, uh, impediments. But there's Shakyamuni Buddha in this world, in this Saha world. How can that be, effectively? In other words, what, what that, and that's one of the debates. How can you have a purified world, and then you have Shakyamuni, Shakyamuni Buddha, who existed in this Saha world? And so that's, that's what this is about. In the Vimalakirti Sutra, after Shakyamuni Buddha reveals a Buddha land, Shariputra asks him why Shakyamuni Buddha's field, field has so, Buddha field has so many faults. The Buddha then touches the earth with his toe, at which point the world is transformed into a pure Buddha field. He explains that he makes the world appear impure in order to inspire his disciples to seek liberation. In other words, it's an example of Upaya. If, if the disciples lived in his world, which seems perfect, then what do they have to transform for? The, it's already there. And, and that's part of the debate. Well, if we live, if all things are pure by nature, therefore I too am pure by nature, which is a term, uh, a mantra that I used last week, then what are we doing? How are we changing that? Now, I'm not going to go into Jodo Shinshu's discussion about that. It has to do with Mapo, which is the, the period of the degenerate Dharma and all that, because that's going to get us down a separate rabbit hole that I'm not, I don't want to go down right now. But in other words, from that quote from the Vimalakirti Sutra, we see that Shakyamuni Buddha is using this Saha world as an opportunity to teach the Dharma to those who are not yet enlightened. Theoretically, in some of the debates, only Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to the 10th stage, which is the stage just previous to becoming a Buddha, can exist in a Buddha field. And yet here we have an example in the Vimalakirti Sutra, which I'm going to quote again in a little while. Um, 
in the Vimla Kirti Sutra that's answering one of those questions or maybe even spurring on more debate. And by the way, if for those people who um, are relatively new to Buddhism, there's two things to remember. Number one is that logic in Buddhism is not always consistent and it is often contradictory. And that if you don't like ambiguity, you're not gonna like Buddhism. <laughs> Those two things keep in mind because both things are necessary to, to be a practitioner. To, that is to say, to recognize that the contradictions exist in Buddhist philosophy and that ambiguity is encouraged to a very large extent. So the background, let me go into the background after I was, let me stop there. Are there any questions that people have so far about what I've said before I go into the background? All right, is everyone thoroughly confused? Yes, Joe. Um, maybe, I'm not sure this is intentional, but it, you, you use the three different words and I would like to understand if you are, I would like to know if you are using three different words in the same sense or different, namely, the Buddha fields, the Buddha land, and the pure land. Yeah, they, the, in, in many ways, they are synonymous. They're just different, different terms that are used in different places, but they're referring to the same, the same thing. The distinction would be a Buddha field is a Buddha land, and you'll find both, both translations of the terms used, and the, and the term that, that we're talking about in this case is um, I always forget the 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 term itself. Hold on just a moment. Um, you know I'm not I'm not seeing it. But anyway, the the term that is often used is Buddha field Buddha land is the same is a synonymous term. They those two things refer to a pure land. So a pure land is different than the Buddha field Sukhavati for instance, is the pure land of Amitabha. But it, that is a Buddha field. Okay, go ahead. You had your follow-up question or comment. Yeah. Um, correct me if I am wrong. Uh, but my understanding is that whenever people say Buddha land, they people usually, not, not whenever, the, more often than not, people use it in the singular, right? The pure land, the Buddha land, but... Buddha fields. Right. Yeah, and that's, and that's a good point. The distinction is this. When we talk about the Buddha fields, plural, it's because there are many universes, and each universe has a specific Buddha that is in a Buddha field. When we say pure land, we should be saying the pure land of Amitabha or the pure land of Akshobhya or the pure land of Vajagata Guru or whatever Buddha we're talking about because each pure land has its own Buddha that rules over it. So Buddha fields is the plural for all the Buddha lands or pure lands. Does that, does that make sense? So would it be, how do I say this? Would it be possible that there may be some Buddhists who maintain the duality between the pure land and non-pure land, namely this world? But what I what I hear from the expression the pure uh, uh, Buddha fields multiplicity. Mm -hmm. So so I wonder whether some Jodo Shinshu people may may basically take a dualistic kind of approach. Well, it, the, for Jodo Shinshu, obviously, they are coming from the perspective of venerating specifically Amitabha or Amida Buddha. That's not, and they would argue, if, I, if we had a Jodo Shinshu minister here, he would argue that, yes, there is the pure land of Akshoba, etc. But we're concentrating, because we're concentrating on the qualities of Amitabha, which are not the same as the qualities of Akshoba or another Buddha. That's how that's how they that's how they would view it. Um, okay, Joe. Okay, I, I have a question. Yeah, let's have, let's let's go to Mushin and then I'll I'll get 
up there. Uh, I'm probably mistaken. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I was under the impression that a Buddha field is anywhere where Buddha Dharma is being taught and practiced. Well, that would be one way of looking at it in the sense that theoretically, at least, a Buddha is teaching the Dharma in some place. So a, a Buddha field, but to, to make it clearer, but not every place is a Buddha field. So no. I'm teaching the Dharma right here, but yeah. is this a Buddha field? No. No. Not by def not by this definition. And how about the temple? No, because what's the Buddha that's here? I, I'm, I'm giving you the, the two sides of it. So there are those who would argue that there must be that because this is the Saha world. This is the mundane world. And the mundane world is not the same as the Buddha, Buddha land, to use that term, okay? So, or the pure land. And so there is a, that's part of the debate. If you look at Jodo Shinshu, which Joe was talking about just a moment ago, Jodo Shinshu is venerating Amida Buddha with the expectation that upon their death, they're going to be reborn in the Buddha land of Amida Buddha. So that would have to be different than this place. On the other hand, <laughs> there's the, the pure <clears throat> that that is the pure. Yeah, but we're, not, but we're, not, we're not in the pure land. A pure land is a Buddha land. We're not in the pure land. But what well, actually we do? <laughs> we do. But but aside from that, but aside from that, just the concept of pure land or Buddha land, that's really what it comes down to. So. That's why I'm saying there's a got there's a many contradictions in this. That's why I was saying it before. And there's many ambiguities. And it depends upon which lineage, which school, et cetera, you're discussing it with. From a Tendai perspective, um, let me read on a little bit later, and that'll make sense in a Tendai perspective. Okay. Any other questions back there? Yes, Luigi. So Buddha Land is not in this existence plane? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> in some lineages you do in other lineages we can we can inhabit it at the same time that's the 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 uh quote from Vimala kirti sutra that said chakimana buddha put his toe on the ground and demonstrated that this is the pure land but he disguised it as a saha world but also remember within tendai and Tiantai, Buddhism specifically, there is no distinction between the mundane world and the absolute world. So within a Tendai perspective, yes, you can be here in a Buddha land, but not. On the other hand, it depends upon what's your intention, where's your mind, how are you perceiving it, how are you living it? So it comes down to not just a spatial notion, but it also has to do with how are you perceiving this world at this time? If you're in a, if you're in the midst of suffering, you're not in a, you're not in a Buddha land. If, if you follow what I'm saying, if you are then if you extinguish that suffering in some way at a particular point, well, you are. And you can even argue, as did Gogen, that that's what sitting on the cushion is. Sitting on the cushion takes you to the pure land. That if you're just washing the dishes, you're not necessarily in the pure land, but if you're sitting on the cushion, you are, to make that, to make that contradistinction. Okay, I'm going to give you a little bit of background, and I'd like to read something. Oh, Maynard, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was I was just going to ask, you know, for basic guidance as you run across ambiguities or inconsistencies in the teaching. And obviously, through the history of Buddhism, with so many different teachings, you can run into a lot of inconsistencies. What is the right attitude that you're just trying to shape what beliefs or practices you think are going to be helpful to you? Or you just live with a cognitive dissonance because it's all empty, basically, uh, or you know, or do you follow the lineage, the teaching and the lineage you're practicing? 
what is the proper orientation and attitude of a practitioner? I, I think it should be that you look at the material that's being given you with an open mind. And at some point you have to say, I don't know what the right answer is, but this is that as you were implying with your, with your question, but I will do that which works for me and works for the benefit of others. Ultimately, what works for the benefit of others is the greatest, the greatest dictation of what one does or dictates the greatest of what one does. How does it assist others? That's the bottom line. You know, and then through that, then how does it assist me? And then ultimately is sort of a, a smell test, which makes the most sense to me. You know, I, I think you apply all three of those, the, all three of those criteria. The, the point is, and, and you, you ask a really interesting question. And the point is that we, we've lived continuously in a state of delusion. What is the nature of reality? And we think we know based upon whatever sensei in, you know, sensate input that we have, we think we know what that reality is. But we have to be open to the notion that the reality that I'm experiencing is not the ultimate reality. And that when I go forth, the best that I can do is work with the best that I've got helping other people. That's the, that's the bottom line. But to recognize, yeah. recognize that we, that the ultimate reality, there's no distinction. That's the ultimate reality is that there is no distinction. But that's difficult for us in this particular realm that we live in, that we get up and have breakfast in every day. So the implication of that teaching is you really would never argue with another Buddhist practitioner about doctrine or whose practice is best. You would simply describe your own practice but you wouldn't pass judgment on their practice. But if they were curious about your practice and why you thought it was helpful to you and to others, then you would tell them, but there would be no argument about it. Is that correct? Well, that's a Tendai notion. <laughs> that's a Tiantai notion, is right. that there's no reason to argue with others because Chi Yi taught us that it's all that Buddhist teaching was one teaching. And it just took many forms at different periods and different people of different capacity have a different understanding of it. And when that also would be consistent with the original Shakyamuni's teaching also. I think so, yeah. yeah. And, and the person in the upper left hand corner always, I can't see their names. Ralph, you had, did you have a question before? No, I didn't, but I do now. <laughs> okay. um, Go ahead. A question, not so much as a question as a, as a, a comment. Um, I believe that in the original suttas, uh, didn't Shakyamuni make the point about uh, investigating uh, and, uh, and uh, 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 taking on that uh, set of beliefs, that set of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, thoughts and philosophy that suits one best? Well, actually, what, it, what, it, what he was speaking to was you try what is given to you, and if that doesn't work, then find what does. Yes. To, 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 I mean, that's, that's really the way it was presented, you know. But thank you for the question. Let me, let, me go on and, and, oh, let me go on and give you a little bit of background, which I love to do. Um, so going back that it's elaborated in the Mahabatsu, and that's from the second century BCE. Um, and this, I'm going to use a quote. Then this will confuse you further. So hang on to your hats. In this, there are many, many universes or world systems which are devoid of a Buddha. For Buddhas are relatively rare. Moreover, the Mahabatsu notes, there cannot be two Buddhas in the same Buddha field. For this would imply that one Buddha is not adequate to his tasks. Throughout the infinite universes, there are innumerable Buddhas and 10th stage bodhisattvas. Each leads infinite beings to liberation. 
And the reason I wanted to bring this up is to demonstrate there was a very early reference to the Buddha fields. And it implies that to begin, to begin with, there are many universes that don't even have a Buddha because they're relatively rare. But furthermore, you can only you cannot have two Buddhas in the same universe because that would imply, as it says, that one of them is not doing his job or her job. So you can see how there was an evolution of the notion of the Buddha field and we, as we go forward to the time where we get down to the Vimalakirti Sutra and later sutras, and you even have in the Lotus Sutra a situation where only one Buddha can speak to another Buddha, which means that you would necessarily have to be have two Buddhas in the same Buddha land, right? So that's an example of how the evolution of thought has taken place over 2,000 plus years. Um, that's why I wanted to raise that. And I also wanted to, uh, uh, please go ahead, Joe. So which comes first, uh, the field or the Buddha? In other words, right, each Buddha for, <laughs> One Buddha for each field, Tendai, California, <laughs> one teacher. <laughs> uh, uh, England, ten, Tendai, England, one teacher. Okay. So, so which comes first? There are many fields to which each Buddha is appointed or that Buddha, each Buddha creates a field? Well, actually, the, 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 way that, the way that you put it last is closest. The Bodhisattva, is in a, a bodhisattva as he or she develops, develops the Buddha field into which he or she will reside at a later time. So one would, so I hadn't thought about it before, but as you ask it, I think about the, this, the debates that have taken place in this. And the bodhisattva comes before the Buddha. Once the Buddha arrives, the Buddha had the Bodhisattva has created the Buddha field into which that Buddha can now reside. So I actually have a I actually have a response for you. Uh, whether it's the chicken or the egg, I I can only speculate. <laughs> but at this point, I think I've got a response for you. So the Buddha comes first; the field comes later. Okay. Now that's not to say that there aren't many universes. There's there's many universes. But each universe does not yet possess a Buddha field. Let's put it that way. Okay. Um, really quickly, I want to point out that Takasaki, Takasaki points out that a paradise outside the mundane world is shared by many religions. Further, he asserts, and I quote, as regards the prominence gained by this way of thinking in the Mahayana Buddhism, it is possible to suggest the influence of the role of light in the religion of ancient Persia. And by this, he's referencing Zoroastrianism. And it's interesting because when Ichishima Sensei, who isn't here this evening, he sent me an email to say he wasn't gonna be here, but he had read this and he was using his research and points out that actually the idea of the Buddha fields may have actually originated in Persia by Buddhists. And the Buddhists then used Persian iconography to try to convert them to Buddhism. <laughs> and so it's one of those situations in which there was a Persian influence on the Buddha fields in a very interesting fashion. <laughs> and I'd like to, to read to you, and this is a rather long little section, but I shouldn't say long little section, that's oxymoron, but it's a rather long section, but it might answer some of the questions that people have. And this is in uh, Paul Williams, Mahayana Buddhism, The Doctrinal Foundations, which is a, one of the treasures of uh, Buddhist, um, modern Buddhist scholarship. Um, Paul Williams being a, a uh, really astute scholar. And I'm going to, in this, the, the section I'm reading is on um, specifically the notion of Buddha field. That's the section that it's in. Um, 
and this is in reference to what had gone before and it's it's dealing with the notion that i raised before how do we explain this world that we live in since shakyamuni buddha was part of this world that's what it's making reference to but where does this leave poor shakyamuni muni his buddha field is impure therefore shakyamuni with his purifying activity as a bodhisattva were obviously strikingly ineffective. To quote from Shari Putra in the Vimala Kirti Sutra, and I said that I would quote the Sutra again, and this is the translation by Thurman 76. If the Buddha field is pure only to the extent that the mind of the Bodhisattva is pure, then when Shakyamuni Buddha was engaged in the career of the Bodhisattva, his mind must have been impure. Otherwise, how could this Buddha field appear to be impure? Moreover, Shakyamuni Buddha and I go on to, to read, not the quote from Ilakirti. Moreover, Shakyamuni Buddha has now gone. While there are still many sentient beings here in the world to be saved, his compassion must therefore be defective. Good question. There are a number of ways in which one can deal with these problems. First, and this is the rather long paragraph. First, one could simply say that all Buddhas are in fact identical. Shakyamuni Buddha appeared to help sentient beings at a particular time and place. Although he has died, there are many other Buddhas and also pure lands elsewhere. These Buddhas are continuing to help beings in this Saha world. One could combine this with the scheme of the Buddha bodies. Shakyamuni was a transformation body, an emanation of another Buddha who remains in a pure Buddha field still active in all the ways for the benefit of sentient beings here on earth. In other words, the impure Buddha field is not the primary Buddha field, but a skillful means of a Buddha who necessarily, as a Buddha, has a pure Buddha field. Alternatively, this transmundane Buddha could himself be Shakyamuni, as in the Lotus Sutra. Another strategy would be to see the Buddha field as the range of Buddha activity but not necessarily purified by his previous activity. He creates it as the most suitable Buddha field for particular beings to be saved. This strategy was strikingly adopted by the Karuna Pandarika Sutra, a sutra which sought to restore Shakyamuni to preeminence in the face of pure land cults centered on Amitayas and Akshobaya. These other Buddhas teach sentient beings who can reach their pure lands but the greatest bodhisattvas, the real bodhisattvas, vowed to appear as Buddhas in impure realms, tainted Buddha fields out of their great compassion. The very fact that Shakyamuni appeared in the Saha realm, a ghastly case, place, indicates his remarkable compassion. I find that to be a really striking way of summarizing um, the question that was asked before. Are we in a Buddha field, are we in a Buddha land right now? So it really depends, if you, and you can see the, the, I didn't go through all the arguments that, that Williams goes through because that would take us the rest of the night, but it indicates the, that once you have the concept of Buddha fields, which is a necessary concept in Buddhism from second century BCE forward. And it's related to the past, present, and future Buddhas. It's a spatial notion of those Buddhas that once you have this concept, it's something that you struggle with in, in much the same way that I might add that it's, it's, it's a comparable struggle as Christian theologians or Jewish theologians struggle with certain contradictions that arise within their particular fields. And so um, it's one of those situations that is placed before us in order to provide dissertation theses for people in Asian studies for centuries to come. <laughs> so do we have any other questions about this? Well, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. I just rocked. So, good to see you, Dick. So, what is the Tendai perspective again? 
Well, you would have to, I would have to say that there is no Tendai perspective. There is. I would have to say there are Tendai perspectives. It's, if you had 10 Tendai scholars in the room discussing Buddha fields, you would have a hundred different viewpoints. <laughs> Very telling you. Yes, it is. Yeah. So, but, but to, to summarize that, if I were to be at Yo on Hiezon and I thought, how am I going to stay out of trouble with my teacher during Yo? I would say that the Buddha field is a place that is pure by nature and that Shakyamuni Buddha, taking from what Williams had just said, that Shakyamuni Buddha recognized that in order to save sentient beings, he had to enter this world and teach. And so that at the times that we're being taught the words of the Buddha, we can reside in a pure land, in a Buddha field. So when you're meditating, when you're doing other activities that are like that, you are occupying a Buddha field. That's not the strict definition that we have from the second century BCE. But that's the evolution of the concept. Okay, does that make sense? If it doesn't, that's all I got. <laughs> are there any are there any other questions or ideas? Yes, say again. So my question would be, how would you teach this to a population that is used to thinking of Buddha fields, and I'm talking about paradises, in a literal way? Do we teach it as a uh, meta metaphorical teaching, or we teach it like whatever suits you the best? For example, I think I I think that when we look at the notion and and okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna step back for a second and let you know that I'm speaking now as a university professor. Okay, as a university professor. I would have to say that the Buddha fields are a mythology that provide a guide for, and I, I discuss this in the Dharma talk later, that provide us a guide for how to live. That's what I would say. Do I there? But having said that, now I'm going to step back into the priest role for a moment. Um, typically, I don't have a priest hat. I don't even have a professor hat, so I can't change my hat. Um, although, um, oh, you're up there. That's right. Chodin does have an R, an R hat. Anyway, <laughs> not to confuse everyone. Coming back as a priest, I would have to say that we approach the idea of, of the, let me back up. If we accept the notion that a bodhisattva through his or her purity of thought and action and speech creates a pure field, which can ultimately become a Buddha field. Then one can argue, as I would, that when we do those activities, such as meditation, that, that is uh, uh, a sincere meditation, that and a, an effective meditation, when we are doing calligraphy in a way that is with pure thought, pure action, pure mind, when we do a chanting with the same exuberance, that we are creating a Buddha field for that period of time. Because it is true, in, and especially in Tendai Buddhism, that one of the distinctions between Buddhism and many other religions is there the idea of sacrality, what is a sacred place, is in some cases takes place because of location and other events, but it can also be stipulated as sacred. So our hondo <laughs> is stipulated as sacred. We create a sacred space. When I do a blessing, like a wedding, when I do a wedding and I do a wedding outside in a park, let's say, what, 
when I'm doing Goshimbo, the mudras and mantras at the beginning of the service, I'm creating a sacred space. And that sacred space then emanates out for the period of time in which that occasion is taking place. Okay. Thank you, Master. Thank you. Are there any other questions or thoughts? So many. <laughs> yes, Chodin. So a, a Buddha field in some ways, at least is a process of induction, of, of creating it through intention. And that's the purpose of ritual that's described in many sutras. Uh, especially with mandalas and instructions, is that correct? That you yes. are creating those things? Yeah. I, I, I think a good example would be when we're, you know, we're currently going through the Makashikan. And in the Makashikan, you see that at the beginning of the meditation, you have to create a sacred space by, you know, cleaning it. First, you, you physically clean the space and then you hang various banners, implements, etc. and you're creating that that sick that sacrality in that space. That is thought of as creating a Buddha field. Because now when you're doing meditation, um, that becomes a space by which it's purified and the meditation is now um, takes on a very different meaning than just sitting in your lounge chair in your living room. Yeah. Is that, does that respond? Is that the, okay. Yes, thank you. Are there, are there any other questions? Back here? No. Chip, are you holding your head because it's about to explode? <laughs> We, we may we may have a catastrophe here because I think Chip's head may explode soon. So just well, you did preface it at the beginning of the lecture. Uh, it, 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 so, there's no sense to be made at Buddhism. It's all all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you pick that which God. I, that's not what I didn't preface it in those words. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> say that. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask y'all to go on out to the hondo, and I'm going to give a very brief Dharma talk, and I would ask that the people on the this evening, um, I'm going to be doing the, when we do the, the meditation, I'm going to be doing a Vipassana meditation that is a view of the Buddha fields. And this view, and, and I, I'm going to tell you a very, a very brief vignette or, of something that actually happened. Uh, one of our members from many years ago, his name was Ralph, um, had, was in the process of dying. Uh, he was being seen by hospice at the time. And some of the people here know, remember Ralph. Um, he was in the process of dying. And so he really, I gave him the meditation on Pure Land. And the meditation on Pure Land, I knew that there was a particular place in the Adirondacks that he really loved, that he would go to um, with his daughter and his wife uh, for many years. <clears throat> and so I gave him this visualization of this, and that became his Pure Land, was this spot in the Adirondacks. It was with a pond and a uh, particular type of location a mount in, the, in the middle of the mountains. And when at one point Ralph had been, um, it was in great pain. And for some reason, hospice wasn't able to respond quickly. So his daughter brought him to the hospital um, to do something about the pain. And he was at the hospital and the door goes in, the doctors bring him in and says, well, we don't know, you know, we, we gave your, your father something for the pain. We don't know what's going on, but he's hallucinating incredibly. 
And she said, well, what's he hallucinating about? And he's, she said, well, he keeps going on about being in a pure land where the trees are growing like this and the streams are running like that. And there's the moon is shining at night. And he keeps having this hallucination, keeps talking about it over and over again. And we don't know what to give him because of his hallucination. And his daughter says, he's not hallucinating. He's in the pure land. <laughs> well, here's one of the things to remember. When we talk about the pure land of Amitabha Buddha, that's the pure land of Amitabha Buddha. It's a pure land in responding to a question that was asked before, there are many pure lands. And the pure land doesn't resemble Sukhavati. Yeah, a given pure land does not resemble Sukhavati, which is the pure land of Jodo Shinshu. And I'm gonna to read to you what the pure land of that sounds like. Again, Shariputra, in the land of Sukhavati, there are lakes of seven gems full of water with eight meritorious qualities. The bases are strewn with golden sands. The stairs on four sides are made of gold, silver, barrel, and crystal. On the banks, there are abodes of many stories in galleries adorned with gold, several, silver, barrel, crystal, white coral, red pearl, and agate. The lotus flowers in the lakes are as large as chariot wheels, are blue in color with blue splendor, yellow colored with yellow splendor, and on it goes. Describe, describing jade hanging from the trees, lapis lazuli flowing in the streams. The pure land I described in the visualization for Ralph and that I'm going to do tonight looks nothing like that. Rather, it's a natural setting. And perhaps in the Berkshires, the Adirondacks, or where I grew up in Pipe Stem State Park in West Virginia, Southern West Virginia. In the Jodo Shinshu community, there's an understanding that while one may seek to be reborn in the pure land of Amida Buddha, we are obligated to create a pure land in this Saha world, much as the discussion posits that Shakyamuni Buddha demonstrates to Shariputra. This is similar to the Shaker belief. Shakers were a religious group for people who do not know, a religious group in America from the 18th century. And actually the house that this temple sits on was a Shaker farm. Well, the Shakers believe that it's the obligation of the followers to create a heaven on earth. It was a Christian sect. This is not just an appearance or the notion that we should not be fouling and raping our mother the earth in a physical fashion, though that would be a really good start. It is also how we conduct ourselves, caring for others deeply, not just with lip service, in our words, kind and understanding, and how we nurture all the children, not just those that are born to us. In many ways, the symbolism, the imagery, and the intent of the teachings of the Buddha fields, the pure lands, the land where Amitabha, the Buddha of immeasurable life and light resides. Rakshoba immovable one represents consciousness as an aspect of reality, reigns supreme. Mythology is meant to help people better understand, relate to, and connect with the world around them, as well as the conflicts inside themselves. Myths serve as a gateway to the hopes, fears, and desires locked within the human psyche. By creating common beliefs and encouraging widely practiced rituals, myths bring entire cultures together. While this may be a mythological place, the Buddha feels, myths are important to humans in everyday ways. And it's up to us, you and me, all of us, to understand this mythology as not mere imagination. We are given a myth as a template so that we can model our behaviors and make it real. So this evening, about the Buddha way, about the Buddha fields, the Buddha lands, the pure lands, recognize, as I said before, that it is a type of mythology. 
But when I use the term mythology, I'm speaking about something which has power to move people and use the Buddha fields as a power to inspire us. And I thank you. Svaha.